it was frustrating because we were charging people, you know, a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars to do a deep dive and do all the lab testing at everything. And almost every time they had poor air and then they had to invest in air filtration. And most of them would have been so much better off if they skipped doing all the testing and they put the money into the solution instead of the data. This is one of my probably most favorite episodes because we're talking about not just mold, but we're talking about the air quality. And definitely that is a way or the way really to accumulate mold in your body. It's really not by what you eat, but it's by what you breathe in. And I have Mike Feldstein on with me today and we discuss all the ins and outs of air quality. And if you're one to think this is just kind of a boring topic, believe me, before the mold situation, I thought it was pretty boring as well. But if you think about it, I mean, if you care about the water you drink, if you care about the food that you eat, and if you really are health conscious and tossing all the toxins in your home, then air quality is truly one of those things that we need to pay more attention to because it affects not only how we physically feel, but how we look. It affects skin issues. It can affect our endocrine system. If you have a baby, a newborn, if you are in the workspace, if you work from home especially, I I mean, who knew that, I mean, just cooking actually toxifies your air, uh, let alone all these other things that we think are perhaps just doing daily. And they, they may not even be, you know, a, a bad thing. They may not be quote toxic, right? Like cooking, it's not necessarily toxic, but it just, it is what it is. And so we're talking about some ways and tips that we can help clean our air without purchasing any kind of air purifier, just some free helpful things. We also talk about Jasper and how this particular air purifier is different from all the rest, what to look for, how to really test things. I personally am getting a second one because it's just changed our entire way of living. And I personally feel like even if you are not in the market for a air purifier, just having these helpful tips and being aware of your environment can really change your your whole outlook and and your health just by what we breathe and a lot of people are nose blind these days and if you get migraines if you get allergies if you get digestive issues believe it or not all of these things can be linked to the air. If you have a poor night's sleep, maybe you have insomnia and you're just like, I just can't sleep. I'm doing all the things. I'm doing the red lights. I'm turning off my devices at night, right? Like, but you're still having issues. It could possibly just be the air and uh, improving that. And so at, even at the very end, we offer $400 off. So listen to the very end because you definitely don't want to miss this discount of $400 because it's something that's only going to be for a limited time. And I really hope this episode helps you and just brings more awareness. If you think that it could help someone else that you know as well, please share it with them to help them be more aware. And I mean, it's just something I'm super passionate about now, obviously. And um, even with this Jasper, you can try it risk-free. If you don't like it, try it out for a month. See if it helps your sleep. See if it helps your skin. See if it helps your breathing, your digestion. See if your migraines go away. If they don't, he even says you can send it back for free, like all of these things. So I really, again, I hope that this impacts your life in a positive way. And without further ado, let's get right into the episode. All right, Mike. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk to me. I am so excited to dig in because I think everyone should know really about what we are breathing and how important it is for our air and how it affects our health. I like to start my podcast with some rapid fire yes or no questions, and you can only answer yes or no. Are you ready? Okay. All right. First question. Does cooking pollute the air? Yes. Can you improve your digestive system by improving your air quality? Uh, without making any claims, um, my instinct is yes, based on what I know. So, but I also need to be careful with the health claim situation. 
So sure. I believe in an indirect way, there would be benefits. So All right. there's my, my long-winded maybe yes. Fair enough. Okay. Is dust collection in the home a sign of something more serious going on in the air? Yes. Ooh, interesting. Anyone that has a dusty home, definitely pay attention here. And I feel like we all can uh, have that dust. So, okay, next question. Can removing all toxic chemicals, cleaning products, laundry soaps, et cetera, from the home mean that you have removed toxins from the air? Yes. Hmm. You didn't say 100% of toxins, but you will have removed a lot of the toxins. Okay, well, so if even if you remove toxic soaps and materials, are there still toxins in the air? Yes. Okay. All right, last question. Can mold in a home come back after thoroughly removing it? That is a, oh, yes. Ooh, <laughs> it, probably never right. left in the, it probably never left in the first place. Well, I can't get, I can't wait to get into this. Many of my listeners know that I, I recently am dealing with mold, specifically a ball of mold attached to my lungs. And so this is all new to me, all new to my listeners. And so now I am diving into the air that I breathe. And just from what I have shared already, this is probably something that has come on in my own life, probably since I was 10 years old. I'm almost 35 now, grew up in a moldy home, grew up right above a garage with gas fumes coming out into my apartment, a hundred year old home that was really never renovated or anything like that. So that's where me and all the doctors think that it has stemmed from and I've just been living with it. But not to get, not to bore you, Mike, with all of that, but just so that you know, um, I'm super interested and I think a lot of people should know more about our air quality. And why don't you f- officially introduce yourself and tell us how you got in to the air purifying industry? <laughs> So first of all, yeah, it sucks that you're dealing with that. And um, I hope that you can, you know, have a great outcome in how you deal with this and detox it because we need people dealing with their own situations who are uh, willing to A, be creative about solving that problem and then B, talk about it. Otherwise, we're not really helping the collective intelligence improve at all. Um. So um, thank you for sharing and documenting your journey and also other folks who may be dealing with some symptoms that they haven't been able to find out what the cause is um, may have another avenue of places to potentially look. Um, So that's great. Um, Next up, so my background is, my name is Mike and my background was in wildfire, floods, hurricane remediation, toxic mold cleanup, things like that. And we would also test people's air. So we were the guys, uh, if you were sick at home and you didn't know why, and you know, you're know you chronically just unwell, you may not even realize that you're unwell, but whether it's itchy skin, dry eyes, headaches, chronic fatigue, and then you go on vacation, whether that's hiking or camping or just to another country, and you feel way better. And you're like, hey, I feel great. My energy levels are awesome. I feel better. Then you go home and you go back down to your baseline. You feel ill again and then have this aha moment. Is my home making me sick? We were the guys that you would call to come to your house and do a deep dive into what's in your indoor environment and make plans to improve that environment. And it was very annoying because what the industry standards would consider good weren't actually very good at all. So it's kind of like the way you go and get a standard blood test for your doctor checkup every few years. And it's like, yeah, we'll call you if you're dying, but they don't, they don't like proactively tell you what they're testing, run through all the tests with you. And this is what it felt like. We're testing everyone's air. It's like, yeah, like your carbon monoxide is not through the roof. Like you could sleep there tonight, but like, the air here is not good at all. Um, so I saw this as an opportunity. And the, the sad thing is we were recommending to basically everybody. We'd go to test their house and it was not great. And then 
we would make recommendations for them to invest in better air, better water, things like that. And the solutions that existed were either like big, large industrial commercial air scrubbing machines. So you either had this like real amazing machine that could clean the air so well, but it was super loud, super ugly. Or you could get a little thing from Best Buy or Walmart for a couple hundred bucks, which was cheap and small, but it didn't do anything. And it was frustrating because we were charging people, you know, a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars to do a deep dive and do all the lab testing at everything. And almost every time they had poor air and then they had to invest in air filtration. And most of them would have been so much better off if they skipped doing all the testing and they put the money into the solution instead of the data. Like, I, I, I don't recommend water testing for most people because I recommend just filtering your water. And if you really want to test your water, test it after you put the filter in because nobody has good tap water. So instead of you spending the budget on confirming that your water is bad or your air is bad, it's just a lot more practical to just optimize the situation, pay for the solution. Because there's generally, if you live in North America and most parts of the world, your home is not a very healthy environment. If you think of it's just so removed from nature and it doesn't breathe well, it's got a lot of chemicals in it, you know, we're cooking indoors. So the home is just not really great. So we have to filter our water, we have to filter our air. And then the other part of my background was I would be in California during wildfire season, Houston during hurricanes. So we would remediate really toxic floods and fires and hurricanes and disasters. And then through doing all of that work, I basically just got to see, A, how sick people were in bad air environments, and then how poor you either had to have these massive industrial machines or these little teeny air purifiers. And I'm like, how come there's not like an SUV of the air purifier? Something that's like beautiful and made from metal and, and, a, and a good product out there. Because I was just looking for something to recommend to my customers. And when that didn't exist, I'm like, you know what? There's a thousand other companies like me who test the mold and, and remediate homes. But how come no one's made a really good solution yet? So the vision for Jasper was just to create an air purifier actually for wildfire smoke. It was supposed to be for people in California to buy during wildfire season and just generally have it for the pollution and the, and the wildfire smoke. And then COVID happened and we ended up selling explicitly to doctors and dentists. And then it kind of um, moved from there to now being a, a health and wellness and a sleep thing. But overall, my, my kind of mission in life is to be an air quality educator, to raise awareness of air. If people are already out there thinking about the food they eat, the water they drink, my job here is to just show them the what the air they're breathing is one impact it's having it's on their health and on their life and just shine some light through the experiences that I've had. Yeah. Well, and I love that you're doing that. And I think a lot of people thankfully are now more aware of the water that we're drinking a lot more. There's like a huge movement in getting a, a water purifier and doing all the things, even like a whole uh, water system for your home. And that's great. I love it. But I think that the air awareness is still lacking and people just don't really think about it. And I mean, there's websites that you can go on and like type in your, your zip code and it'll tell you the water quality. Is there maybe a website that does that for air or no? The problem with air is it's also those water quality websites aren't very accurate because they took they, they update that data every so often. It's not real time information. Unless it's like a local lake and you're testing for like algae or bacteria or something. But like those those things that tell you about the tap water, that was a moment in time. So it's it's not the same all the time. That water, the source is changing, the pollutions are changing. So even if you go and get an air quality measurement, that was a moment of time. And air has moments where it peaks and spikes and it it gets critical. So it's not the best way to go about it. You can look at averages over time, but pretty much unless you live in like the Costa Rican rainforest or Vancouver Island or like the Amazon, if you live in an urban, a rural environment, you have all the farms, the farming chemicals, glyphosate. If you live in a suburban area, you still have all the building materials, the pollution, the cars, the industrial life cycle. No matter where you are, you're going to have allergens, you're going to have pollen, you're going to have mold. So unless you're going to like literally go move it to the middle of nowhere, we cannot escape the, you know, your water needs to come from somewhere too. You might be able to truck in spring water for drinking, but all of your other water is going to have to be filtered on site. 
it's just the the reality of living in a modern world is we have to filter out some of those things that we don't want to consume. Yeah, well, and I have to tell you that I've had a Jasper and I'm I'm getting another one because I love my first one so much. And this is an interesting story. So I I get my Jasper and it's not, I mean, crazy huge, but it's not small either. I'm trying to think of something that would be um, like equivalent, but it's, um, what would you say like the size is? I'm like trying to think like at the top of my head. Like if, if you were to explain it to someone. You just it made me remember something funny. A few years ago, when we didn't have as good photos on the website or measurements, someone goes, I don't know if this is the size of a salt shaker or a trash can off the picture. And um, so Jasper is about 30 inches tall. So it's, you know, almost up to your, your, like your waist, top of the legs. Um, and it's about a foot in diameter. So the idea was like a condo building. Let's go up and not out. Because you need a certain amount of size to have a high quality filter. The filter is very large on that thing, which is super important. Um, so I don't want to say a trash can. It's kind of a negative connotation. But it's it's a, it's a steel cylinder. And it's, yeah. a, it's about two, two and a half feet tall by a foot, a foot in diameter. Okay. Yeah. Th- there you go. So it's we get it. The first one, we get it in the mail. And... I'm so busy. I run, you know, I'm just like, I don't have the time to put this together. Uh, And typically I just have my husband put things together and figure it out. He's very handy in that way. But um, anyways, like he wasn't even home and I'm just like, whatever, like, I'm just going to open it. I don't want to give him another task. And so I open it and it's, and all I had to do was literally put the filter in super easy direction. I plug it in and press the start. And I was like, that's it. Like, I don't have to, like, figure anything out. There wasn't really, like, anything for me to, to read. I was like, that's easy, and it just starts going. Um, and so then my husband sees it, and he's like, well, this is cool. And I was telling you offline, like, he's such a water and air nerd. And he's like, this is, like, this is amazing. Like, we had a, a, a previous air purifier, and it was fairly good, right? It had some good reviews and stuff, so we were using that. But he's like, he was doing his research, comparing. He's like, this is amazing. Um, and, and we have a pretty, like, tall ceiling, too. And I know that there's maybe some misconceptions of, like, well, figuring out the square footage. Like, he's doing the math, you know, and he's like – figuring out, okay, it's not just how wide, but how tall our ceilings are and like all the things. Um, And so anyways, long story short, it was super easy to put together, super happy with it. And um, maybe you can explain a little bit more of what should we be looking for when we're looking for an air purifier? Because I think there's a lot of dupes out there and maybe people even aren't measuring the right way and getting the right the right item for their square footage. Yeah, so uh, let's come back to that. I just want to level set for people because uh, I'll put a pin in that because I think it's important. But I think just like why air matters is a more foundational place to start for people. Do Um, it. And if you just like thinking about this for a sec. So the average person, uh, pretty much everybody, you can go three weeks without food, three days without water, and only three minutes without air. You likely eat two pounds of food of day of food in a day. You drink maybe two liters of water, but you breathe between ten and twenty thousand liters of air. So to me, it's wild that people are thinking all about the microplastics in their water and their toxins in their food and their their Kellogg cereal dye and all that, which is super valid stuff that you should care about. Meanwhile, they're breathing way more microplastics than they could ever drink, and they're consuming more pollutants via the air. You know, the fastest think about if you go and get surgery, how do they put you out through through, you know, a gas mask through air because the fastest way to your bloodstream is through your lungs. So literally the number one thing that we could survive the least long with. It's the first thing when we do when we're born, we take our first breath. We can literally go, you know, the first six months of our life and even way longer. We can like live off of breast milk uh, and not even a huge quantity of it. We can't live without air. It's so core to our existence from day one that without it, we would die. So if you look at Maslow's hierarchy, air is first. You wouldn't even, we couldn't even be talking without air. I call it sleep fuel at day. I call it thinking fuel during the day. Uh, uh, thinking fuel during the day, sleep fuel at night. It's the only thing that you're consuming all night long. And there's four ways things get in your body, right? You eat it, you drink it, it gets absorbed through your skin, or you breathe it in. 
So your mouth, your nose, and your skin. And most things, whether it's mold or allergens or chemicals, we don't even consider all the things that we're taking in through our nose. And if you smell something, whether it's a dirty diaper, whether it's cooking, whether it's that asphalt when you're driving by and they're doing work on the road, or if you're at the beach and someone's using sunscreen 100 feet away and you smell the sunscreen, you smelling the sunscreens means you're, you're, ingest, you're, you're inhaling the sunscreen. It doesn't smell like sunscreen that you're breathing in. It is sunscreen. I can't so, stand that. Yeah. So if you think about like just from a fundamental st- standpoint, um, then what we clean our homes, you know, we're busy wiping our surfaces, our counters, our kitchens, vacuuming and mopping. To me, that this is the equivalent of if you had a fish tank and you're every day you scrub the bowl of the fish tank, but you don't filter the water or change the water at all. You could be scrubbing the side of the fish tank as much as you want, and that water is black. It's like, yo, dude, filter that water, change that water. You could scrub the side of the tank all you want, but you've got to have clean water in the fish bowl. And our homes are essentially those fish bowls. And instead of water, the way the, wa- the fish basically you know breathes water, we breathe in air. And air is so scarce. It's this little space between sea level and the, and the mountains. It's only like 10,000 feet or so, very, very small, is the actual area of breathable air. So more than thinking about air as this separate thing, just realizing you live in air. If you move your hands around, it feels like you're swimming. Air is like, it's a gas. It's very similar to a liquid. So what water is to fish, air is to people. We live in it. And then within that air, in outside, Indoor air in our homes is five to 10 times dirtier than outside air because air outside has this beautiful natural air purifier. We have trees, we have wind, you have the UV light from the sun, we have rain to wash away particulates. We don't have any of that stuff inside. That's why mold is not, there's a lot of mold outside, but mold is not a problem outside. We don't really get dust accumulating on our, on our lawn or on our driveway. Dust is an indoor problem. Cooking. When you cook outside, you have the whole world for ventilation. When you cook indoors, things trap inside. So to just sort of level set here and look at the amount of air we breathe, how much stuff we're getting from our air, whether that's the oxygen, the carbon dioxide, or all these chemicals that we don't want, um, and it just hides in plain sight. And and like you said, how easy it was to set it up. Uh, There's a quote by a guy named Dean Jackson. He said to me, he's very overweight, and he's not into wellness at all. And he said, Jasper is the laziest way to be healthy. That's why he likes it. He's like, he's explaining, he's like, honestly, I have a really hard time with exercise and eating good food and all that stuff. But he's, in, it, it's so difficult, you know, delicious food is often so unhealthy. And habits that are so bad for us, they're often so addictive. But, but there's nothing that's nice about drinking polluted water or air. It actually feels great to drink clean air and to breathe clean air and drink clean water. So it's like the the rare part of health and wellness where it's actually easy, it doesn't require any willpower, and it's actually more enjoyable to drink filtered water um, and breathe filtered air than the polluted stuff with which with food, often it's so opposite. The sugars, the fats, the salts are are so addictive. And um, so I just wanted to like level set for people for a moment on just broad air awareness Uh, before we get into any of the nitty gritty of what's actually in our house and what we can do about it. Yeah. No, I think that's, you make a very valid point. And there was um, actually, there's a a few studies. One of them is that I heard, you know, everyone thinks that we're getting, you know, currently uh, we're getting into fall, winter, and it's quote flu season. And everyone thinks, oh, it's flu season because it gets colder. Well, I heard that that's actually not the case. It's flu season because everyone stays indoors because it's cold outside. It's not because it's necessarily cold. It's because we're not outside as right. much as we are in the in the summertime. I couldn't agree more. This is very anecdotal, but like you said, I think people have definitely studied this in the past. But when I lived in British Columbia for a little while, where everybody's skiing and hiking and biking, I don't really think we had that like cold season like when I was living in Toronto, where everybody spends 99% of their time indoors. Um, The other thing that's pretty relevant is it also is very dry in the winters. Um, So if you're not 
used to that or you're not optimizing the humidity in your environment, then the dryness can be pretty harsh. But yeah, it's extra harsh indoors. So you're inside all the time, artificially heating the air. So it's just a very unnatural environment to be in. It's already dry. Then you add heat to make it even more dry. And then you're inside inside all the time. You're not exercising. You're not breathing fresh air. You're not you're not ventilating very much. You're not changing the air. Um, so I totally agree with with that. Yeah, and I honestly think that this whole you know, what what are we almost in 2025? But like in 2020, you know how they said everyone stay indoors, and not only were, was everyone staying indoors, but they were sanitizing the heck out of everything with chemicals and breathing that. So you're not getting fresh air and you're breathing all these chemicals and it was just a storm for disaster and it just made I think every, everything 10 times worse and I mean we know now now we know a little bit more <laughs> about what happened and um hopefully most people are more aware I mean even the mass didn't really do anything but um all that to say is people you know staying indoors all the time it, I think it can cause a lot a lot of harm and uh, especially if you are already in a unhealthy environment, so like maybe you're living in mold and don't even know it, you know, and it's just one thing layering on top of another. So I want to talk about the stuff that's in our homes, and I also want to give people some free tips that they can implement today that that doesn't involve them spending any money that they can yeah. do with the existing stuff in their home. But have, have you ever heard of a term called zucosis? No, what's that? So zucosis is the study of what happens to animals that are in captivity. So it's called zucosis. And what happens is when they, a a couple big facts. So elephants live to be 17 years when they're in the zoo as captive animals. And they live to be 55 in the wild. Um, Dolphins swim 100 miles a day when they're in the wild and they can't swim anywhere in captivity. So when you start looking at monkeys and and various primates and birds and all kinds of wildlife, what happens is the animals in captivity are dealing with mental health, mental health, depression, anxiety, cancer, uh, you know, chronic arthritis, inflammation, basically everything that humans are suffering with. It's the exact same has the animals in captivity. And it really got me thinking, like, the way I kind of view things now is I view our subdivisions or our buildings as the zoos and our homes and our apartments as the cages. How crazy is it that in maximum security prisons, the prisoners get an hour outside to be in the yard and, and, and sunshine and physical activity that's more than the average American gets outside on when they, and they have free will. So I believe that very similar, we, we can learn a lot from the study of animals in captivity and realize, oh, shoot, our homes are essentially captive environments. We spend over 95% of our time in them. And then, you know, we're all trying to be conscious with our screen time and getting our kids off the iPads and, and using them less ourselves. However, um, what is, that, what is the average American's house layout? The living room is two couches facing a wall with a TV on it. That's just a giant iPad for the whole family to use all at once. So people are just spending way too much time inside, completely separate from nature in these artificial environments. And yeah, it's basically just like every other animal in captivity that's really struggling with this sedentary indoor captive life. Um, I think it's no different than than it is for us humans. No, I I mean you're right, and so many people now um, they're even working from home, and yes. I feel like that can be a blessing, but also a curse. You definitely have more control over your environment when you work from home. You're not succumb or captive to you know the the workspace, but again, you're just always inside. You're never leaving. But, but yeah, and so that's really interesting about that, that animal um, study, though, and those statistics. Now, you had mentioned some, some tips that we can maybe take yeah, away. Yeah, so now, now, now let's bring that back to what we can do, right? So, um, so in the house, the problems that we're trying to solve for are most indoor environments, over 70% of homes have a lot of indoor mold, and that's because the house is, house is not breathing. 
we have all of our chemicals and toxins from our furniture, our flooring, our tables, our paint, our drywall, our insulation. Like we have just no, nonstop off-gassing chemicals in our home from everything we bring into our home. Um, and then we have pets. And it's not just the pet itself. It could be the, often it's the cat litter more than the actual cat. So we have all these things. And then cooking. Cooking is one of the biggest culprits of indoor air pollution. Because literally, you have high heat, possibly with a gas-induced flame, and then you're cooking oils and food. Like, why do you think you smell the food in the entire home? It's because you're cooking in there. And when you cook proteins at high heat, you get incredibly, you get PAH, which is called polysilic aromatic hydrocarbons. It's the same thing that we actually um, test for when we were remediating homes after wildfires. So it's a, um, a huge carcinogen, big problem. And then w- when we cook, you smell all that food. But where do you think all of that particulate goes? It gets embedded in your furniture, your carpets, your clothing, your bedding, everything that's porous that could theoretically absorb water and get wet also absorbs air. So you cook and then all those particles just get kind of embedded in your environment if you're not filtering your air and ventilating properly. So what people can do. Number one, a huge, huge uh, tip is check your... There's two primary vents in your home. The one above your stove, which is also called the range hood. Um, And then you have the bathroom fans. With the range hoods, first of all, you want to make sure they're working. So take a tissue, paper towel, Kleenex, whatever, and hold it up to the range hood and make sure it's actually pulling the air and it's creating suction. If it's not holding the tissue up to the range hood like very solidly, then you better then you know for sure it's not pulling enough air. Then you also need to make sure that that vent is actually venting outside. A lot of times people have a range hood that's venting in their attic, in a in a wall cavity, up in a cabinet. It needs to be venting outside. Otherwise, you're taking all those particulates and pollutants and you're just dumping them into another part of your home. Same fish tank. Um, Bathroom fans, same deal. So you want to make sure that you are filtering, that your bathroom fan pulls a tissue, and you also want to make sure that's venting outside. It's not going into your attic, because if it is, a lot of people get moldy attics because they shower, and then they dump all that humidity into their confined attic space, and it creates a big mold problem. So making sure that those vents work now, when you are cooking, let's assume you've done the tissue test, your range hood's working, it's venting outside. If you're boiling stuff on the stove, Use your back burners because the back burners collect a lot more of the polluted air than the front burners do just because the the food is more directly under them. And with your bathroom fan, after you shower, like leave those bathroom fans on for a few hours at least. Just think about how much water you can soak up off the floor with the towel. Towels can hold like, you know, well over a gallon of water. It's pretty amazing how much water you can absorb in a towel plus all of the residual water sitting in your shower. Well, if you're not venting, closing that door and venting it out of the house, all that humidity gets trapped in your house. So if you think about a whole, let's say a family of four and everyone's taking a shower every day, that's quite a bit of extra humidity that you're adding to your indoor environment that's trapped and it can't breathe. And homes, since the 1970s, we've really been prioritizing energy efficiency. So a home is designed to keep the cool in in the summer, and keep the warm air in in the winter. So it's not very well designed for environmental health. It's designed for energy efficiency. Unfortunately, when we trap everything inside, it creates a very harmful environment, especially if we're not filtering our air. The other big one is not wearing shoes inside because we bring in everything from outside. 95% of shoes tested have fecal matter on them. Almost 100% of them have like Roundup and glyphosate on them. And that's just the beginning of the list. So if you come inside, especially if you walk on your carpet, that's not going anywhere. That's just going to be there. Your kids are going to crawl in it. Your pets are going to be in there. It's going to get kicked up every day when you're vacuuming and when you're cleaning. So just like be mindful of what you're bringing into the house. And then same thing, optimizing your your cooking, your laundry soaps, your hairsprays, your all the fragranty things, you know, don't use any Glade plugins or air fresheners. Uh, If you're, if, you're, if you're using candles or incense or anything like that, either A, do it outside, B, open a bunch of windows. And if you're not doing those two things, at least make sure you're filtering your air because 
you're bringing all of these things that are not supposed to be trapped inside your fishbowl and you're you're really polluting your your water your air in this case so if you're polluting your air with all these chemicals and all these sprays and all these you know fire and smoke things in your cooking and you're not filtering it and you're not venting it out it's like no wonder the human is not doing so good in there we have had a no shoes rule in our home since inception. Um, when my home, I grew up in a in a home where I mean, you could put your shoes on the couch. It was like one of those homes. But my now, you know, having my own place, um, we've always had no shoes. We have a no candles rule, rule. My husband and I, we don't like candles, even if they're unscented, even if they're quote non toxic. We just don't like burning candles. Um, and the the cooking vent tip, I'm gonna start cooking on the back burners now. That's a really uh, good tip there. Um, now, obviously, let's just say someone does te- uh, test their range hood and it's it's not sucking up the Kleenex and it's maybe just like circulating, right? And just blowing air. They would want to get that fixed immediately, right? Yeah, so like level one is let's make sure it's pulling air. Two, it's venting outside. The other thing I didn't mention is you cannot... Cleaning your bathroom fans and your range hood like annually is also a really good idea. It's not, you don't need a contractor. You know, it's not a big deal. You just get up there, wipe it. If you're a little extra handy, you can take off the cover and wipe it a little bit better. Um, Because often they get so caked up with like, especially the the one in the kitchen that it loses its airflow just because it's it's dirty. But yeah, if that is an issue, getting that resolved to me is, is like step one. Getting it fixed, getting it clean, making sure it vents out. And then like, don't only use your range hood when you're cooking bacon, just because, you know, you may not be smelling everything you cook. I actually really like a range hood. Sometimes fan speed one is not too obtrusive. Like range hoods get really loud. So when it's on full speed, it could be, you know, quite distracting. Maybe the family's watching a show or a movie, you got music on, or you're having a conversation and it really disturbs that process. But like level one is so much better than nothing at all. Um, yeah. So getting the, the ventilation, cause like, the equivalent of if we go back to the fishbowl, the equivalent of changing the water every so often for a home, that's opening windows and that's using your vents. The equivalent of filtering the water is filtering your air. So the way that you get fresh water, uh, let's just call I'll just use the water analogy. Like, how do you get fresh air into your home? It's by the old, um, you know, the dumping out the old air. There's a principle in air. It's it's called one CFM out equals one CFM in, meaning if you have your bathroom fan running, for every liter of air that's being exhausted outside, one new liter of air is coming in through your doors, your windows, your cracks, your vents to pressurize the home. So by venting the old water out makes room for the new fresh air to come in. Mm, yeah, that's a really um, interesting. Yeah, I, I really like the whole fishbowl analogy. <laughs> it's very helpful. Yeah, me too. Um, now, my my husband, he does um, a lot of renovations. He will do like a, a bathroom remodel, kitchen remodels, and he's um, definitely had his fair share of coming across mold when he rips out, you know, the wall and the drywall and sees mold. And so we are now, you know, very aware. And he's always so good about changing the the AC vents. And I think we try and do it like every four months or so. Is there a typical rule uh, regarding AC vents? So you just mean like the general furnace filter? Yeah, like your air conditioner, you know, your your heating and all that. Yeah, so um, to be honest, I don't change mine very often. And that's because I filter my, I filter my air. So even after seven, eight, nine, ten 10 months, my furnace filter is pretty much pristine because similar to indoor dust, if that furnace filter is getting dirty, just so people know, that furnace filter is not designed to clean your air. It's called the furnace filter, or the, you know, it's not called the air filter. It's not for filtering your air. It's designed to keep large particles out of the furnace. Big clumps of you know, dog fur, or a nail that goes down a vent, or a bunch of dust. It's designed to protect the motor and the fan in the furnace itself. So... That's why you need to, and, and to keep the, the vents and the ducts clean. So that's the primary reason for furnace filters. When you try to use it as an air filtration system, you actually decrease the pressure and the airflow. And now your whole HVAC system performs a lot worse. You can also void warranties, 
you're, you know, it won't heat and cool as good. Like that machine is designed to mix the air in your home and heat it and cool it. It's not okay. designed to be a, an air filtration system. In fact, when we started Jasper, I spent a couple of years trying to de- develop an HVAC air system and I tested everything and they basically didn't do anything because when your furnace turns on and off throughout the day or your air conditioning turns on and off, when it's not running, the filter isn't doing anything. So it's like if you have a swimming pool, you can't only use the filter when you're heating and cooling. The, the, the heat pump is supposed to kick on and off, but the filtration is 24-7. So when you tie the filtration system to something that turns on and off, it's very, very ineffective. Also, wow. you're literally cleaning your baby's nursery as much as you are, you know, um, the hallway that or the crawl space that nobody goes in. So I, I like to focus the cleanest air in my in my sleep areas first, create my sleep sanctuaries. And then from there, I like to filter the air in my living room to capture all of the cooking particulates. Okay. Now I have like 10 questions on tap right now and I, they, they can all go in different directions. So, but I, I do want to kind of piggyback here because while we're talking about the home at the beginning of the interview, I did ask regarding dust and if yes. there's a lot of, you know, dust in your home and let's just say, for example, you, you dust something and then like three days later or even like a week later, it's dusty again. And so what does that typically mean? I grew up in a very very dusty home. Um, and now I, I'm like completely 180 where I don't like any knickknacks. I like everything clean lines. Like what does it mean when there's dust accumulating like every week and you have to dust all the time? Well, I'll tell you, we don't really get dust at all. Um, we have four, I think four, maybe even five dusters in my home. So we're filtering our air a lot. Um, and we have virtually no dust. Very, very you know, every few months, a light, light, light dusting, but basically almost nothing. Um, dust is a symptom of bad air. If you think about your, let's say the TV media unit, that's all dusty. It's like, where do you think the dust, how, how did the dust get there? Did it A, emerge from the TV unit or B, come from the air and land on the TV unit? So you very quickly realize it definitely didn't, the dust didn't come from the surface that it's on. So it came from somewhere. Where did it come from? Um, And dust isn't one thing. Dust is a mixture of many things. Dust mites are one thing, which can be a big problem. So usually when people say they're allergic to dust, it's actually either A, they're allergic to dust mites. Um, And if if anybody's on a phone or a computer now, Google a close-up image of a dust mite. Uh, You will be shocked. I'm scared to now. Did you do it? I'm going. I'm going to. I mean, I'm scared too, but I'm still going to go. I'm do, going to do it after the interview. <laughs> yeah, you'll be shocked. Um, if this was honey, I shrunk the kids. You'd be real scared of that thing. So they're they're little creatures. So check them out. On top of that, the the dust is basically a vessel for everything else to travel. So whether that's mold spores, allergens, pollen, everything kind of hitches a ride on the dust. So yeah, dust is. A symptom of bad indoor air. If you're filtering your air, it's just like, you know, if, if, if we were looking at that fishbowl analogy, if we were starting to see some algae and some growth on the side of the tank, yeah, it's because the water wasn't very clean. So we start to get growth and physical things are occurring now. It's gone beyond an invisible substance that's just in the water. And now it's like actually a surface problem. So some people are like clean freaks and they're cleaning their counters. They have housekeeper come over three times a week. And they still, they're always trying to stay on top of the dust. But it's hilarious. They could spend a fraction of that budget and just have clean air in their home and not have to be chasing the dust and, you know, staying on top of the symptom. They would actually deal with the root problem that it, of whatever was causing that dust. Um, humidity plays a big role in dust as well. So basically all of this to say is you really shouldn't have a very dusty home. So a lot of people, they start with like, you know, if they put clean air, really clean air in their bedroom, then all of a sudden, at least their bedroom will be dust free and their sleep environment will be dust free and they can kind of take it from there. But yeah, just if you go outside right now, uh, look at, you know, I'm looking at my, my furniture outside in the backyard. None of it has dust on it. So when you kind of realize that, wow, that, that big and, you know, you don't see black mold outside either. You don't see black mold growing on the outside of the home. It's on the inside because. These are environments where we the the best air purifier in the world is nature, the trees, 
the water, the sun, and the wind. And it's unfortunate that we've built homes where we've trapped all of those, we've, we've trapped nature's air purifier outside and we've blocked ourselves inside. So yeah, now we're dealing with the consequences of, of a polluted environment because we've tried to be so separate from nature. Where is mold typically found in a home? And I'm assuming it's like the bathroom, the kitchen, right? Where water is. But are there other areas where we should be checking? How can we check um, all the things? Yeah. Sure. So I always tell friends, if they're ever renting a home or an apartment and they need to break their lease, I say, call me, I'll come over, I'll find the mold and get you out of your lease. Because I can always find the mold. So the other big thing to realize A lot of people don't have physical black mold growing in their home. And this is a huge problem. So remember, I was the guy remediating homes and hotels and apartment buildings from massive amounts of mold. And often the biggest difference in a $2,000 quote and a $50,000 mold removal quote is it's often, not always, but it's very often how well that company knows how to sell fear. So... When there is physical black mold situation, you need to get it removed and remediated. And you know, that can be anywhere. That could be a roof leak that could have dripped down through the drywall and manifested in your basement. Or I've seen times where there's mold in a bedroom on one side of the house, but it had come through a little tiny, tiny roof leak into the the ceiling cavity alongside the whole home and then into the bedroom on the opposite side of the house. So often it's like a pinball machine back and forth and back and forth. So it could be a roof leak. It could be foundation leaks, uh, cracks in a foundation. It could be, uh, you know, a hose bib, like um, a spigot that's slightly leaking inside. It could be under a sink. It could be in a toilet bowl. It could be behind a shower. It could be on the inside of a bathtub. But a lot of times, people don't have a physical black mold situation. What happens is they have high airborne levels of mold. But everybody has airborne levels of mold. So it's like if you test water for bacteria in the pond or in the pool or whatever, there's always some level. It's how much, what kind. Is that too much? So what's very sad is when someone is not feeling well, they go and get a urine or a blood test done. They're like, ah, I got the mold. I have high levels of aspergillus penicillin or something like that. That's the most common one. And then they go and get their dust and their air quality tested. They go, ah, I got the aspergillus again. It's in my body. It's in my home. It's making me sick. Well, if you could test your body for pollen or for heavy metals, you're going to have some of that too. These are not black and white things. Of course, there's pollutants and toxins and particulate in our body. So what's very disappointing is when people, they get the blood test, then they get the air test. They don't have a, a big mold problem. If they just you know, filtered their air, open their windows, like mold is outside. So when I would test homes for mold, we would usually run three to five tests inside, sometimes more, and we would test the outside. And what you're looking for is the, the contrast. What is the indoor level compared to the outdoor level? So, and you're not supposed to test the mold in a home unless it's been like two or three days since the most recent rain. But nobody follows that because how could you? Like, the customer is not going to be happy to pay you for the job that you cancel because it rained yesterday. Um, if you then didn't pay your staff, uh, they would have to quit the jobs. So everybody kind of is doing the best that they can. Nobody really follows that. But a lot of people don't even do the control sample outside at all. So there's always going to be mold inside. Um, and that's a very important distinction to make. You want to make sure your home doesn't have elevated levels of mold. Because no matter what, your indoor levels of mold are always going to be at least as high as outside. Because where do you think your indoor air comes from? From outside. So there's always going to be a lot of aspergillus and spores and all that in every breath you take. But then if the levels are way higher inside, then we know that there's additional sources of mold coming from the indoor environment, like stachybotrys or ketomium, and there's a bunch of others. So what we're looking for is elevated mold. And then... So a lot of people are treating airborne mold as if they have a physical grow- growth, and then they start playing whack a mold all over their house, where they're ripping out bathrooms, they're riching out kitchens, they move into another house for six months that's likely moldier than the house that they left. So if you think about it this way, if we let's say you have polluted water in your house, do you a get a water filtration system, or b gut your house and rip up the pipes? So a lot of people are gutting their entire homes 
looking for every last bit of mold. But if we look again a few months after we've cleaned it, even a week or two later, you're never going to address every source of mold. And especially if you're testing the air, the only reason when people get a, a clean air test after their mold removal is because during the mold remediation process, you have commercial grade air purifiers in your home cleaning the air. So if you, if you turned off those machines and you tested the air t- a day or two later, you, you won't have no levels of mold. They'll be back to the ambient levels of mold, the same as outside. So it's a, it's a, it's kind of the wild west. And when I was in the mold industry, they called it the mold rush or mold is gold. Oh, and because my it's, it, you know, it's a big industry and everyone's trying to get educated as quickly as they can. And there's some good actors and there's some bad actors and people are trying to do their, their best. But there's a lot of, so there's, there's necessary fears where people really have a problem and they can, you know, hire a good remediation company. By the way, always get three quotes and, and take your time hiring it. But as soon as someone finds mold or is suspecting mold, the first thing you want to do is filter your air. Because, and this is what I was advising people way before I was in Jasper. It's like, if you have a leak in your home, you don't call the contractor. You call the plumber to stop the leak. So if you're suspecting that you have airborne mold in your home, the first thing you want to do is stop yourself from breathing that mold. And air purifiers are very effective for airborne mold, which is a great news. Mold spores are actually very, very easy to filter. Um, it's one of the things that they're most effective for. So yeah, the whole mold situation is a tricky one because it's, it's hard for people to identify, do I have a normal amount of mold? Do I have an ex- excessive amount of mold? How big is this problem and how should I approach it? And it needs a lot more nuance than is currently being provided to people. Yeah. And I think too, like you said, there's a severity and thankfully we don't live in a moldy home. It's, you know, we've tested, we have like brand new home and I haven't lived in a moldy home, but like I had previously said, I grew up in a very moldy home that was over a hundred years old. And short little story is growing up, I mean, the home was abandoned before we moved in when I was four years old. That's like how old it was just falling apart. My parents didn't have the money to fix it up or renovate it. So we just started living in it. And for at least 10, maybe 15 years, there was this bathroom and it had visibly black mold in it. And that's where we would shower, take hot, steamy showers for years on end. And then my mom would have us, you know, on the weekends, try and clean the black mold with toothbrushes and not knowing really anything about it. And that was just what we did for chores. And of course it never actually went away, (laughs) but that's just what we did. And no education on it. And it just went on and on. Thankfully, I'm in, I'm in a better place now. But regardless, I think that's where it all stemmed. And it's just been kind of dormant in me for a while. And I feel like I'm not a mold expert, but I feel like everyone has some bit of mold in them. It's just when they get hit with something, like let's just say they get hit with COVID real bad, and then the mold can perhaps take hold and like overtake you where before if you were doing all the right things, exercising, eating right, you kind of maybe kept it at bay. Again, this is just my like theory, but I think that's why I never really had a problem until until I got COVID and then I never just felt right ever since. And so anyways, but that's just my theory of that. Maybe we do all have mold. Yeah. Every breath we're taking, we're breathing, we're breathing in mold, we're breathing in pollen. Something that I love seeing what happens is when people suffer with allergies, start filtering their air in their home. So we did a study in August. It was really amazing. Um, it was a four-week study. One, we gave 100 people Jaspers who were using Aura Rings to track their sleep. And the average person, um, they had one week of Jas- uh, one week Jasper off, two weeks Jasper on, one week Jasper off. So the average person was sleeping 25 minutes more per night with a Jasper in their bedroom, um, 18% more deep sleep, and five minutes faster to fall asleep. And the reason that is, is largely because if we test the air in the average bedroom, let's say there's about a million particles floating around in every breath we're taking all night long, between 0.3 and 10 microns in size. This could be dead skin cells, hair cells, mold, allergens, the VOCs from all around your home, the dust, you know, the neighbors cooking, insects parts, all the stuff that makes up air. And then when you put a good air filter in your bedroom, you're cleaning your air by, let's say, 95%, if not more. So now all of a sudden, you're not bombarded by all those mold spores and the dust mites and the allergens 
24 hours a day. So then your stress bucket really gets to drain. And then what happens is all day long, you're fine. You can go out and handle some allergens and some pollen and some mold and some toxins. We're very uh, robust, but it's the 24 hours a day that like chronically beats us down. We don't get to like recharge our batteries and our bodies staying in defense mode all night long instead of entering a healing state. So when all of a sudden you turn your bedroom into a sleep sanctuary, super clean air, you know, comfortable bed, you got it dialed in. Now your body knows how to heal itself and remedy itself. But when it's constantly under attack of polluted air 24 hours a day, it has a really hard time turning down, turning down the defensive walls and, you know, repairing itself. So that's why I believe that it's a blessing and a curse that we spend like 95% of our time indoors. It's a curse because obviously that's way too much time inside. But the blessing is we can turn our homes into like havens for not very expensive. You can you can control your water, your lighting, your air, your your noise. You really you have this one environment that you can totally optimize. And I think the number one thing within that environment to optimize is like I'm actually starting to work with hotels to get Jaspers in a lot of hotels now. And I said the first thing I'm going to help them do is reposition it. Instead of calling them guest rooms, why don't we start calling them sleep sanctuaries? Like let's design the hotel room to be the ultimate sleep. Ex- hotel rooms are often tiny. They're not for hanging out all day. People want to explore the city, go to the conference, go to the events, go try restaurants. But what they don't want to compromise in, they don't want to get sick in the hotel room because they're breathing all these chemicals and the last person, whatever they have in them. Um, People shouldn't, they should have a chance to recovery, recover, heal and have their best sleep ever. It's like all you have to do is give people amazing sleep quality here. And how can you possibly do that with all the chemicals and pollutants that are in the air of these hotels? So, um, just really for me, it's like everybody knows how much sleep allows you to heal and recover. Like I actually call sleep healing time. Like if you're sick, you never get better during the day. You're always like, I get, you get, you heal at night and then you wake up better the next day. Um, so the, anything that the reason that I love being able to, I love to be able to support people's sleep because that re- re- supports everything else. And just like whether you're home, you know, whatever the toxin loads are, there's no breath of air that you can take. Like, that, that doesn't have some levels of pollen and mold and heavy metals and all that, but there's a reasonable amount. And then it's when you start having super clean filtered air and water in your home, that's when I see people starting to like really recover, their allergy symptoms go down. It's like, otherwise, you know, if someone's trying to biohack, eat the best food, exercise the most. I love the analogy of, it's like you're trying to run on a treadmill in a gas chamber. So the harder you breathe, the more bad air you're breathing in. Um, you want you can't detox if you're retoxing faster than you're detoxing. So while other health and experts can help you with you know dialing in your nutrition and your your, your food stuff and um, your habits and your movement, having making sure that your fishbowl is the cleanest damn fishbowl ever is going to support everything else that you're doing. No, I, I think sleep is critical and I think we're all aware that sleep does help us recover. And if you can fix your sleep, you can fix so many other issues that you're experiencing. And a lot of people, they're trying to do all the things, red lights, you know, um, no screens before a certain time, all these things. But yet again, they're still having these sleep issues. And I think this is where a lot of the research is lacking, where a lot of people in the wellness space like you said, they're doing all of the things, but the the research in their air is um, maybe even non-existent and they don't even think about it. And so that's that's why I love that you're bringing more air awareness because that maybe just could be the missing link here. Um, something you did bring up too are hotels. And you're right. No one really stays in a hotel. The reason you're at, at a hotel is basically you're just sleeping there and then you're off doing whatever you're doing during the day. And I hate going to hotels. I hate even going to Airbnbs, especially when they have those like Glade plugins. And it's almost like, I don't know if there's a a way to research like, you know, the best it. Airbnbs. I'm making it. I'm making it. I'm making it. <laughs> what? So we're going to start, we're going to be launching it next year. It's going to be called Jasper Lift. I'm <sighs> building a group of hundreds of, of building biologists from across the country. And when, whenever they travel in various hotels, they're going to be tested for dust, VOCs, particulate, and mold. And we're basically going to create the trip advisor for hotel air. So we're going to, while, while we're there, we're going to test their water and test 
the skincare and the soaps and the housekeeping products that they use. But pretty much, we're going to have a, a trip advisor specifically for hotel air. And a, and a pro tip, I'll, I'll give, let's give you a little insight, is it's almost never good. Mm. Well, put me on that list because I'm definitely going to be one of those people going on your website and and looking for the best air quality because let me tell we'll be, you. We'll be, like, we'll be like the seed oil scout for hotel air. Perfect. Uh, I love it. Um, I would, let's talk about schools for a second because I was also looking at like research in schools and that's where a lot of mold is. A lot of obviously kids, um, they're all in one area. It's not just you and a tutor. It's like, you know, 15 to 20 kids and a teacher and nurseries. I mean, all the things. And um, can, can I put in a request? Can you like start uh, making an impact in schools? <laughs> well, we are. Uh, and if, if anyone listening has a kid in the Austin area, it's the only place we have the program right now, Austin or Toronto. Uh, Cause when units eventually do break, we bring them back and we refurbish them. And then we donate those units to schools um so if and we'll eventually like find ways to expand the program but in the meantime if anybody is in austin or toronto and uh message us and we'll send a jasper to your kid's school amazing i love that mike in, now, in finland they did research and 18 percent absenteeism dropped immediately as soon as they put air purifiers into classrooms <gasps> dang isn't that amazing yeah. what air can truly do um now i want to talk briefly about new baby rooms. And I think a lot of people, first of all, when you are preparing a nursery, a lot of people, they actually do new paint. And personally, I'm kind of against it. I know everyone wants everything brand new and fresh, but I feel like putting new paint actually causes a lot of fumes in the room. It does. And ask yourself the question, why are you doing this? Um, Are you doing this for the baby? Because your baby does not give a shit what color the wall is. Um, are you doing it for yourself? Are you doing it for the photos that you're posting online? Just like ask yourself why you're doing what you're doing. Um, because the be- you know we've moved a lot. The best baby room we ever had was when our baby lived in our walk-in closet. Um, we were we 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 had some um, we renovations that were going to be happening soon after, and it just made more sense. And um, like when you really thought about it's kind of like the bedroom is for sleep. It's like, what's the purpose of this giant nursery that's all done up and fancy and stuff? It's I feel like it's kind of like, I mean, hey, don't get me wrong. I bought my my wife the the diamond ring and all that stuff. But like it just like feels like a bit of a silly thing that it's just like the way that we do things because um and making these like beautiful nurseries. So I'll just comment from the air perspective. Well, right off the bat. You're you're painting it, so you're introducing a lot of VOCs and these whole low VOCs and no VOC paints. You cannot have a non-toxic paint. They're just replacing it with other stuff. Like, what do you think it is then? Whenever people tell you what something isn't, ask it what it is instead. You know, I'm like, what is that you're eating? Oh, it's, it's vegan. It's gluten-free. I'm like, okay. No, well, what is it? You're just mm-hmm. telling me what it's not. Tell me what it is. And... um whenever someone is leading by what something isn't instead of what something is, I just train myself to like put the red flag up and ask a little bit more questions. Um, So it's like, okay, how does this paint bond to the wall? What is the adhesive properties that is allowing this paint to bond to this drywall? How does it work? Is 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 it water? I don't think so. So what is it then? So, you know, asking better questions there. Now, let's say you do want to do the pretty nursery. I don't want to poo poo on people's fun. I get it. We did it. But if you can try to do it like six months early and not like a month or two before your baby's born, at least, and then you can open the windows in that room and really allow everything to breathe and off gas. Also, if you can find it like a really good high quality um, crib or baby dresser stand thing secondhand. So it's all ready. You can get like beautiful stuff from restoration hardware or West Elm or wherever. Um, second hand that's in mint condition and now it's already done its off gassing cycle so it's not being manufactured packaged into a box and then off gassing in your home but yeah if you can just a do that stuff a little like the, if there's three early tips for the bedroom number one 
do it early so and then open the window so we can breathe too. If there is some of the larger furniture you can buy secondhand, I would recommend it. And then the third one is no diaper pails in baby's bedroom. And if it is, that's just for pee diapers, no poo diapers ever. And even if it is pee diapers, dump it out every single day. Because if your baby is pooing and then you're putting it into a little bin and it stinks like poo in there, newsflash, you're breathing a lot of poo. And adults breathe 10 to 20,000 times a day. Babies breathe 60,000 times per day. Uh, And their lungs are smaller too. Tiny lungs, filtration, you know, not really developed, immune system, not super robust. And, you know, babies are getting sick all the time. We're like, I don't know. Uh, so I, I think it's it's fair to mom and dad out there who want to uh, keep that pail in there. Try spending one night with the shit bucket in your room and see how that how you feel about that experience. And if yeah. it's great, well, then, okay, at least you've tried it. And if it's not so great, maybe you should stop doing that to your baby. Yeah, for reals. I think a lot of people perhaps don't think about it because you know, the baby is sleeping in another room and I definitely don't want to be sleeping in a poo room that just smells like crap all day or all night. Um, So we talked about some of the benefits like obviously mold, uh, having better sleep. What are some other benefits of just having clean air? I know that's kind of a a blanket question, but you know. I got you, I got you. So- uh, but you know, it's it, everything you know about food. I mean, food and water, it applies here. So if you eat a Big Mac today, you may not feel great. You definitely won't die tonight. You know, even if you have three cans of Coke today, you, you, you can handle it. You might not feel great, but you can handle it. Now, over time, if you, if you're making a bad food choice every single day, you know, your skin might get bad. Your heart health might get bad. Your gut health, your energy levels. Um, if you start drinking like really bad tap water or even showering in it, you know, your your skin, your hair, air is the exact same as all of that. So there is a huge scale of like, you know, if someone is obese and really unhealthy, their goal is not to be um, a triathlete. It's to not be fat anymore. So for them, it's like, let's eat less food, eat better food and like go for a walk every day. And let's say now you get to that level. You're like, okay. I want to be stronger. I want to get it. I want to get abs. And then for those who go beyond that, it's like, I want to train for an Ironman. You know, there's levels to the game. So with air, it's like, if you are worried about moldy air, smoky air, off gassing from your new home, these things are what's harmful. You know, they're, they could be contributing to autoimmune stuff. They can be giving you itchy eyes, headaches, rashes, poor energy, bad sleep. So that's on like the negative side. So number one, clean air can start decreasing those symptoms, making you suffer less and enjoy your human experience more because you have less a nuisance to deal with, less symptoms. And then taking that to the optimistic side of things, if you have a super clean air at home, yes, you're going to sleep better. You're going to have more energy. There's been countless studies about SAT scores and cognitive health. So clean air, whether it's studying or doing work, um, It's going to make you think better. It's the only fuel for your thoughts is the air. So having a clean fuel source, just like you know, think about how unproductive you get if you have like, you know, a bunch of a rich bread filled fried sandwich at lunch. Like you could just feel yourself slowing down thinking about it. Whereas if you eat like a super clean lunch, your brain is going to continue to perform at a high level. If you're dehydrated, you're not going to perform so good. So if you're breathing poor air, your performance, your productivity, your energy, the way you feel is all going to suffer. So yeah, going from bad air to okay air is going to cut back on those symptoms. And then if you get into excellent air territory, that's when you start moving into that optimal category of like high performance air, high performance water, high performance food. And like, um, so yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a scale here, but you can really improve a lot by living, just going back to that fishbowl analogy. It's like, if you were that fish in there, do you, do you want to be in the murky water or do you want to be in the clean water? What do you think is a better environment for you to thrive as a human? Yeah. Well, and I also think too, there are different levels. Like for example, I will get a migraine when I like walk into a department store with like all the scents yeah. and sprays and all that. But that's like high level, right? But I think even a lot of people are nose blind to 
their laundry detergent and things that they are just quote used to. And once once I started taking away all the the chemicals that you know I was washing my clothes with many years ago and all those things, now if I do for whatever reason get my clothes washed, like if I go to my mom's or like whatever, it's a trip and I experience those toxins that I never smelled before. I'm like overly sensitive. And I think the, my whole point is a lot of people are nose blind and you don't realize what you're in until you take it out. So yes, I'm glad you're familiar with the term nose blind. Nose blind, most people aren't. So when we used to offer demos when I was living in Toronto, we would let people borrow Jasper for a week. And I think maybe two or like 95% of people would always buy the Jasper after you let them have a trial because... Um, what happened is like the way we would do a demo, we'd go into someone's house and we would measure their air quality. So, you know, they would see on their instruments, like a million particles. Then we put the Jasper in their room and we turn it on and they're watching the number go down and down and down and down and, and get cleaner while we talk to them. And then we, we leave their bedroom and go back to their house. And it's like, ah, whoa, this air feels heavy. And it's like, it's like if, if you go outside for a breath of fresh air on a clean day, or if it was stuffy inside, you're like, ah, oh, that's so much easier. And if you pay attention, so I always tell people there is one downside to buying a Jasper and that's it can make you an air snob. All of a sudden, the Uber and, you know, so this is also true for lo- using more lower toxic, healthier products. But as you start living in a clean air environment, you go to the mall, it's not, it used to just be lush and bath and body works that was nauseating. Now it's the whole mall. Then becomes the restaurant, Ubers. Airbnbs, hotels, all walk into a lobby of a hotel, be like mold, like instantly. Mm-hmm. Um, you start becoming aware of the air, and then you're just like your sense of smell and taste can like navigate things for you. Or you know, if you taste something gross, you're like, I don't know if that's so good for me to be eating. You can get that same awareness with an air. So when people start living and sleeping with Jaspers, it actually turns them into an air snob. Then they go to like their friend's house to sleep, spend the night or two. They're like, Yo, your air sucks, and it becomes. People who would sleep with Jaspers in their bedroom and then you would remove it, they would start having panic attacks. So when we did the sleep study, a few people messaged like, ah, do I have to do this whole week? You know, their sleep scores tanked after they took it out. So yeah, basically the the nose blind thing is, is a really, really, really big deal. But the cleaner that you optimize your environment, the more stark the contrast is when you go into environments that have less clean air. On my Instagram, I do a lot of recipes and food and I um, share about ingredients, right? And one of the things is that I always talk about are natural flavors. And once you remove natural flavors from everything that you eat, uh, and then you actually eat something with a natural flavor, it tastes so artificial. And you're like, dang, I was eating this and it was like so good. Or even something even more simple. If you go on like a, a sugar detox and you don't eat refined sugar, you don't even eat uh, like coconut or whatever, like honey or just for like a week. And then you just taste a strawberry. You're like, dang, this strawberry is so sweet. But right. people now, people nowadays, I mean, a strawberry is not sweet enough. Like they got to add the stevia. Right, they got to right. add all this stuff. It's, dip, I think it's like the same thing. Sugar. Ex- yeah, exactly. It's the exact so, same thing as that. It's the exact same thing. That same with water, right? You grew up, water was water. And then when you discover filtered water, tap water is horrible. When I um, met my husband, he really got me into um, a really good water filtration. Before I was just drinking, I was just drinking like the filtered water from the fridge, right? You know, like the little thing that comes out of the fridge. And then he's like, Bethany, like, hey, if we're going to get married, we, you know, we got to change some things here. So anyways, we did. And now like I'm a water snob and I feel like I'm starting to become an air snob even more with the Jasper, um, even after I've removed all of the toxins, now I'm like even more hypersensitive and I I appreciate that. Um, So can I ask, being like devil's advocate here? Yeah. How do you know if your air purifier actually works? It's a great question. Yeah. It's a really good question. It's... um, and if you think about the, the number, the best review that makes us happy online, which is what allowed me to understand this question better, is when I would get that 60% of people who buy Jaspers owned air purifiers before. So, and the best feedback we ever got is I have had multiple air purifiers before. I never knew if any of them were working. With Jasper, it's obvious. 
Uh, and they say that because they feel the better air and they see the air purifier working. So broadly, the if a product is actually working, you shouldn't need outside validation that it's working. Um, like the for example, if you have it in your living room and you cook, you get to see it go red, fan speed cook kicks up, you see the air quality going, and then you watch it decrease it. So a lot of these labs where you go to get these third-party studies are complete bullshit. Literally, you go there to get a study done. And the first thing they said is, what is your marketing goal? And then we will work backwards to get you to where you need to be. Um, that's typically how these labs work. If they weren't handing out A-plus results to everybody, no companies would use those labs. So, And some companies, they test the same thing 10 times, and then they only publish the test result that was good. So I always say the only types of tests I like are real world studies. For example, we put the Jasper in the room, we test the mold, we, te we run the Jasper for an hour, we test the mold again. We do that with a lab, but we actually test the performance of the machine. We typically get an 87% reduction in the first hour. So I like real world examples like that. Or lighting a match with an air quality sensor and seeing, whoa, it takes five hours for the particulates in that bedroom to, to go back to baseline. We put the Jasper in there, it's 60 seconds. So I like actually testing it in the real world. Um, and that's why we, we sent out 100 Jaspers to people, which was not cheap, um, in exchange for one month of their sleep data on Aura. Because we're like, hey, we're getting a lot of reviews about an improving sleep. Let's actually do like a um, an official sleep study to organize this. So I think for people, Sleeping with it. By the way, where is what room of the house is your Jasper in? Ours is currently in like the living room kitchen area. It's like so you leave it on smart one. mode. We leave it on smart mode. Um, and here's an interesting story: is our neighbors are they're currently like putting in a pool, and so um, I open the door to like get some Amazon packages or whatever, and like the smart mode because it it is on smart mode, it like kicks in because of like what's going on next door. Oh yeah. Uh, you, uh, someone named Jordan Harbinger, he's actually a big podcaster. Um, he had a house fire like eight blocks away, not his house. There was a, there was a house fire like eight blocks away and he only knew because his Jasper's all turned red. His other air purifiers did nothing. He went outside and they saw the smoke from like way in the distance. Um, Every time I barbecue, and my, my barbecue is like 70 feet from the house, every time we open the door just to like come in and out, the Jaspers go red. So um, that was a big thing for us was using commercial grade sensors because I hated that Jas air purifiers weren't showing you what's in the air. You know, they're like, just trust me, I'm cleaning the air. You're like, well, I don't feel any different. I don't feel any different. I don't see the air quality. How do I know this thing is working? So there's some crazy stat that would be hard to know for sure, but like over 80% of people never change their filter once on their air purifier. And that's because they just don't actually know that the thing is working. And it's usually not. Unless you keep, if you have like a small air purifier on, you have to keep it on full speed in a small room for it to work. So let's say you have like a two or $300 air purifier. If it's on max speed in your bedroom with the door shut, it, can, it will help in that environment. Um, but it's not a very nice noise. That's why we use so like a couple of things that are different. You know, we made it out of steel instead of plastic. That was really important to me. So it's designed to last 30, 30 years. And that's why we have the lifetime warranty. So, you know, most air purifiers, they have a one year warranty. Well, if they thought the product was going to last longer than a year, they would love to have a longer warranty because that would really help them sell. But they literally only have a one year warranty because they're not confident that the product's going to be working after a year. Um, the reason we're able to do a lifetime warranty is because people change the filters, they know it works, and we have a relationship with our customers that's ongoing. And another thing is when usually you have a warranty claim, it sucks. They're like, do you have the receipt? Do you have the packaging? Uh, send us videos, send us photos. You go to FedEx, get a box, ship it to us for $100. Then we'll investigate it and maybe we'll send you another one. So the way we do the warranty, I'm very proud of. So let's say your Jasper breaks. Cool. We just trust our customers. Um, if they say it doesn't work, we might have like a one tip troubleshooting. If that doesn't fix it, we just ship them a new Jasper with the box with everything. They get the new Jasper. They take it out of the box. They put the old Jasper back in that box that we sent them. 
In there is also a UPS shipping label that we've already prepaid. And we schedule UPS to come to your house at 9 a.m. the next day and pick it up. Because I hate, I have all these products with warranties, but when I want to actually go and use the warranty, it costs me money on labels, shipping, boxes. I got to go to UPS or FedEx and spend like half the day there, driving there, traffic, all that. So we're like, if people's Jasper breaks, is that their fault or is that our fault? And the answer is that's our fault. So that's why we don't play games. So when people are changing their filters twice a year, they get the lifetime warranty. Um, we just merged that all together. Instead of having filters and warranties and everything separate, we made that as easy as possible. And then because my background was in floods and fires and hurricanes and stuff, um, we just made a commercial grade product that has the aesthetic and design that people would be proud to put in their homes because it would look beautiful. Like you could go get a kettle for $19 at Walmart. It will heat your water, no doubt. But if you get the $90 kettle or the $75 kettle, it'll be glass. It'll be steel. It will look beautiful. If you get the $21 one, it's going to be plastic and you're going to literally have to hide it in your cupboard every time you're done using it. So the intention with Jasper is to make something beautiful, silent, smart, that could just seamlessly blend in with your decor and actually be like a look cool instead of um, be a big eyesore. And then the um, in the in the living room kitchen area, smart mode's perfect. You want to keep it on smart mode so it's adapting to the environment. In your bedroom, you'll with the second one that you're going to have uh, next week, keep it on fan speed too. If you like silent, if you like silent when you sleep, you can still keep it on smart mode. But if you like, because we have like a really good motor and fan, um, fan speed two is just like a nice gentle white noise machine, and then the air will be that much cleaner. So if it's working at a higher speed, it's giving you even cleaner air. And then you just hit dark mode to make sure there's no ambient light coming off the screen at all. So yeah, for the bedroom ones, we always recommend a bit of a higher fan speed to have like even cleaner air. Um, that's exactly yeah, so- actually, well, that's something that I do appreciate is the dark mode. And I was like, oh, that's brilliant if you're going to put it in your bedroom. Um, and then for us, we we actually do like a little bit of noise which is almost like soothing. You know how some people like the rain, you know, yeah. on the rooftop or whatever. So I personally don't mind that. But if I think if people don't want it, if they want it super quiet, I think that's cool that you have an actual quiet mode too. Well, 90% of people uh, that we've surveyed do prefer a little bit of white noise when they sleep. Nowadays, you know, there's people have city lights and cars and this and that. They want to drown out the background noise. And if you, anyone who's ever gone camping in the forest, I have a lot. The forest is not a quiet place. Like, unless you lived in a cave, nature is not quiet. So uh, trying to mimic this, like, totally silent box, I don't think is super practical. Um, so the Jasper's fan is supposed to, like, mimic the wind, you know, the, the wind flowing. Um, so, yeah, that's the way. We actually moved up to fan speed three because we, we, like, we like a lot of white noise. And a lot, a lot of babies now, they're using white noise machines. I'm like, that's just the speaker. You might as well just use like actual clean air as your white noise machine. Yeah, I know. It's a two for one. <laughs> and and you're right too. I actually do like um, the aesthetics of it. I'm someone, I get stressed out if there's too much clutter. We don't even have, Same. we don't have knickknacks like on whatever. Like I actually showed my home in an Instagram story. I did kind of like a little home tour and someone was like, how come it looks like no one lives there? <laughs> because it just wasn't like, Whatever, it just didn't look overly like cozy with all of like the things everywhere, right? But that's just my yeah. style. I just I can't. Yeah, our, the, the style we were going for was modern, modern minimalism. So like we still wanted to look like modern, but we wanted to be beautiful and and, and understated. Um, yeah, I think that is that was part of the whole desire. And like you said, how clutter stresses you out. I believe just like air, water, and food are stressors, pollution, etc. I think um, I think noise pollution is a real stressor, and I also think our environments can be more or less stressful. So I think creating a a clean, simple environment that naturally like everybody can feel the energy of a room. So I think design and furniture and all that can be very stress inducing, but also very calming if you are happy with the style of the environment. So I'm glad that you've. Uh, a lot of people don't talk about how like a cluttered environment is actual stress, and but I, I totally believe that it is. 
Oh, I, we we don't even have a, like a, a rug like in in our living room. I think the only rug we have is like the, the like little bathroom rug and like an entryway rug. But other than that, yeah. it's just um, it's too much. Mel, okay, so if someone is considering a Jasper, um, right, and where and they can only get one currently, yeah, where should um, they put it in their home? So uh, number the best place is if you're getting one, it's the bedroom. For sure. No doubt about it. You can't beat a bedroom. And like, I, I want people to know cheaper, like th- you can literally make a DIY air purifier for $200. That's amazing. Like you really can. And there is even really good air purifiers for, you know, half the price of Jasper. But the downside is typically there's always been a trade off. So if you get one that's cheap, it's either going to be ineffective or if you get one that's cheap and effective, the downside is it's usually very ugly and loud. But I still want to give people their options, right? So the DIY air purifiers, most people that in my world don't want to make them. But if that's all someone could afford, uh, I would prefer that they have a solution than no solution. Because um, it's very, it's like we need to be filtering our air. We need to be, you know, opening our windows when we're cooking. There's like table stakes things. Who Jasper is really for is people who want a machine that doesn't sacrifice design, integrity, or quality. So people who want the machine that works the best, looks the best, has the best service and support, and they really care about the design and their performance, that's who Jasper's for. There's a lot of pretty air purifiers that don't work that are cheap. Stay away from those. Um, You don't want an air purifier that's cute, Um, meaning tiny, meaning ineffective. But yeah, the big difference for us is sort of that combination of aesthetic and performance. And um, so if people do decide that they want more than one, just so you know, uh, on our website, the more people buy, the cheaper they get. And we're actually, this episode comes out November 1st, which is very soon. So our Black Friday special is going to be near the end of the month. But what we're going to do for your listeners, and just so you know, we're not on Amazon, we're not on Best Buy, we're not on Walmart. You can't find us anywhere. Because if we started working with those stores, first of all, then the discounts would all be We wouldn't be able to help people very much on price because the stores would take all of the margin. But the real reason we're not in those stores is because they kill our ability to offer a VIP experience for people. You know, if it's Amazon, all you can do is hit the return button or go stand in some line at Best Buy. We don't want that. If someone has a problem, we want to just send them a new machine right away. We take care of it. So that's why we don't work with any retailers. So my whole vision and mission is come on and talk to people who are already health conscious, health aware. They're, they're trying to live a healthier life. And I'm trying to just raise air awareness, one. And then for anybody who feels called by Jasper, beautiful. We love that too. So this episode comes out November 1st. So I've set up an offer for your audience. It's $400 off. Um, it's our, it's, and th- the reason is, is you know we're going to have a Black Friday sale, but not till the end of November. And you can pretty much guarantee that we'll be sold out. We have a very hard... We've been perpetually backordered since Skinny Confidential last May. So we're going to have a Black Friday special, but it's not going to be till the end of the month. So we're not doing any promotions on our website or anything until then. So starting November 1st till November 7th. So for the first week of November, code DIGEST, D-I-G-E-S-T, will be $400 off of Jasper. And that will combine against uh, with discounts. So if somebody does buy two or three or four because they want a whole home filter solution, which a lot of people do, then um, your code will combine on top of that. So just to be clear, today is November 1st. And for the first week till November 7th, it'll be $400 off of Jasper. Uh, the website is jasper.co. So it's jasper.co, but no E. The code is digest. And then for anyone who that doesn't work for, no problem. The code will stay live forever. But after um, November 7th, the code will be just 10% off. But we'll keep that code up forever. You know, not every day or every week is invest in clean air week. So the code will be an evergreen code and it will never go away. Code digest. But for that first week, November 1st to the 7th, it'll be a $400 offer for people. Okay. So for the first seven days, it's going to be $400 off. And then you can stack it on top of if you want to buy like multiples, you get um, an even greater discount. Um, Correct. Now, what if someone wants to try it? Uh, for like a month and maybe for whatever reason, they're not happy with it? Good question. So yeah, we have a a 60-day return policy. So and usually 
if any if someone usually returns it in the first day or before they even got it because like ah like for whatever reason maybe they're moving whatever it is but most people that have actually tried living with it we only have like a two percent return rate but if they do want to then all, all i recommend is for the first month or so it would be helpful if you would just keep the box uh just until you're certain so what we would do is we'll give you a hundred percent refund on the Jasper. So our belief is we only want customers who are feeling a massive benefit. The last thing we want is someone out there in the world who invested money in clean air and then is not confident that it's helping them. And now they're stuck with this purchase. So if it's not an absolute no brainer, hell yes for you, just reply to the emails, purchase, say, I'd like to return it. Uh, and we'll give you a hundred percent refund on the Jasper. And you can take that money and invest in something else that will help you. So yeah, we 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 believe in clean air for life. Um, so if it's not a no brainer for somebody, then yeah, all your money back invested in something that works for you. That's amazing, and I I can be a certain testimony. I'm getting my second one because we love our first one so much, and just from you know all of my husband's research, and he goes down into the nitty gritty. He's like, this is the best I've ever seen. And he's, he actually told me in the, the car yesterday, in fact, um, he said, this is better than the um, commercial. He said, I, I don't want to quote him, but he said it's better or just as good as the commercial um, ones that he's experienced because of his field. And he was like, this is amazing. So anyways. Um, well, to anyone who this resonates with, November 1 to November 7, code DIGEST will be the biggest offer of all time. But don't wait until Black Friday because by that point, we're literally going to be back ordered for two months. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Mike, for just taking the, t- the time to just come on here. And I appreciate that, uh, like, all you're doing, not just within the... Um, the home space, but also the hotels, the schools, and really making an effort for cleaner air uh, for everyone. So again, thank you for all you're doing. And man, um, you you got a lifetime customer right here. So thank you. Thanks, Bethany. It was a lot of fun today. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digest This. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review in your podcast app to let us know. If you're ever wondering how you can support me and this podcast, sharing it with your friends and family is the best way. This is a Resonant Media production produced by Drake Peterson and edited by Mike Fry. To email the show, message us at digestthispod at gmail.com. See you next time. The content of this show is for educational and informational purposes only. It is not a substitute for individual medical and mental health advice and does not constitute a provider-patient relationship. As always, talk to your doctor or health team first.